this uh, putting yourself in the place of the gospel story. Um, have you ever tried to put yourself in the place of a particular story in which Jesus <coughs> is teaching in the temple and somebody comes in and says, um, your mother and your brothers are outside waiting on you and you're standing next to Jesus now. How does he respond and why does he respond in the way he does? And how do you, as sitting next to him, how do you take this? You know the gospel? Yeah, yeah. You, I take it you want me to say, I thought you were going to say what it means. <laughs> <laughs> how did they get turned around? <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, that's an important passage uh, about um, Jesus' relationship to his own family. The story, I think it's, I don't think the right time was setting is the temple. He's someplace else, somebody's house, I think. And um, so, but the, the point is that asked about your mother and father, your mother and your brothers are waiting for you. And he says, well, you know, he puts that off and says, no, the believers are my mother and brothers and relatives. So I think that, that, that the significance is, I mean, it's actually quite a theme found in the Gospels where Jesus sort of uh, plays down the blood relationships and says that the real family he's establishing is this new family of disciples. And that it's not based on blood relationships, it's based on faith in him. That's what we'll establish. Who, who is it that are my mother and my brothers and my sisters are those who do the will of God? So actually it's a very important passage. And um, it, it, I mean it represents the, in the Gospels there's um, the idea that the family of Jesus didn't understand him. In Mark's gospel, both his mother and his brothers are come after him to take him back home because they think he's out of line, that he's, uh, you know, not functioning properly. He's not, you know, he's too much of a maverick. He hasn't stayed home and found a wife and pursued a career and all of that. So you get a tension in the gospel between Jesus and his family. And uh, the broader statement that he keeps making is that, no, what really counts is doing the will of God. And that that's what creates the new family. So he's about a new creation. So it's very important. I mean, but it, you know, if you put yourself in the scene, you'd probably, you could, you know, who knows what happens. I mean, you could say, well, Maybe his mother was upset about this, or you know, or are the disciples getting the message? But I think that's what the scriptural passage is about, and it's a universal message. And it, and it I mean, it has, you know, it, it opens up the whole thing of well, this community of Jesus is open to a lot of people. The next step is it's open to the Gentiles. You know, it keeps opening up, expanding outward like that which is an important part of the gospel message, important part for us today. Do theologists continue pursuing in their thinking, uh, broadening the word brothers? How is that treated? No. Well, you're into scriptural exegesis, but um, as a matter of fact, when it, it names Jesus as brothers and it calls them Adelphoi, which means in Greek, blood brothers. It doesn't mean cousins or anything else. It doesn't mean relationship by faith. It means blood brothers. And it names four of them, and it names, which is interesting, and it says his sisters, plural, meaning at least two sisters that he had. Now those in Greek are, it's not cousins, it's not kindred by faith. It's blood brother. That's what the word Adelphoi means. That's what the Greek says. Now, I mean, you can go two ways with that and say, well, he had six nice siblings at least. <laughs> That'd be one way to go with it. Another way to go is to try to explain it away. If you're going to explain it away, the sort of obvious meaning of the scripture, you, you might do something like this and say, well, 
uh, we got the premise would be that our religion is a translated religion. You know, Jesus spoke Aramaic and and worked within a Jewish milieu. And all the language is Jewish, the celebrations are Jewish, and the language is Aramaic. And what have we got in our scriptures? Greek. <laughs> you know, so what it tells you is that Christianity from the very beginning is a translated religion. And therefore, you extend it and say it's a translatable religion, meaning it could be translated into any culture at any time and in any language. Now, that premise could be, did, did the Greek get the Aramaic right here? That would be one of the questions. You could say that the, in Hebrew, there's a broader word that would include um, cousins, broad words of relatives. If that was the language that it was portrayed in to begin with, and um, that maybe the Greek choice of Adelphoi is not accurate. That's possible. So you sort of got two choices once you know what the Greek is to say, let's be glad Jesus had nice brothers and sisters. <laughs> or you can say the Greek might have got it wrong and uh, that he didn't have blood brothers. He had nice cousins like James the pillar at Jerusalem. That's where that's going to take you, where that biblical scholarship is going to take you. But it, it really is crucial to see that Christianity is a translated religion. See, it's so different from the Quran. The Quran is in Arabic, <laughs> and the angel Gabriel dictated it to Muhammad in Arabic. <laughs> and they wrote it in Arabic. And that's the only thing that counts. So when our friends get up in the, Jew, in the Christian, Muslim, Jewish dialogue, they begin by speaking in Arabic, because that's what's faithful to their tradition. Christianity is very different, very different. It's translated from the word go in the very early century. So the first writings, uh, probably around 49, that's Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, and then the Gospels by 70, 80, 90, all translated. But your point, I mean, so it raises the question, is the translation, what did the translation do? Every translation changes something in whatever language you put it in. It, do, it does something. I mean, the nuances disappear, and other nuances arise as soon as you put it into Ethiopian or into whatever Slavic languages, or as Matteo Ricci put it into Chinese. It makes a difference. And nuances will be gained and nuances will be lost. Who had their hand up? Yeah. I want to follow up on this. It's not about meditation, but I've wondered for a long time. So did Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, all those writers write in Greek? Yes, oh, they, wrote, they, wrote in they wrote in Greek, yeah. Yeah, and that's what we have extant. I mean, we got fragments back to about the year 125 and fuller manuscripts in, uh, later in the second century, third century. Why didn't they write in Aramaic? That's a, that's a good question, I mean, a very good question. I mean, the fact is they didn't. Um, Paul didn't, Paul, the earliest writer, so it's important to remember, he wrote before the Gospels. It's not like the Gospels were first, so in Paul, wrote in Greek on purpose, because that's who he was reaching out to. That's one thing. And also, if you look at the other Gospels, they needed to, even in Matthews, which is the most Jewish of the Gospels, you, you have a Gentile audience in part. So that he had, uh, the evangelists had to write for their communities. And by that time, the communities included any number of Gentile converts. And those people, for the most part, didn't know Aramaic. Oh, they wouldn't know Aramaic. Greek. Oh, they wouldn't know Aramaic. Where on the other hand, Paul would probably know Aramaic and know Greek. But no, the Gentiles would have no reason, I mean, to know Aramaic. There was, I wouldn't, that's, 
an unimportant language <laughs> to them in that culture. So th this is a very important point about this, uh, the translated character of, of Christianity from the very beginning. And it might be uh, germane to the point that Dick brought up. It's, it's entirely possible. But there's no doubt the Greek text says Jesus has got blood brothers, and we know their names. Well, As our uh, Muslim brothers expand beyond Mesopotamia, the, the rest of Northern Africa, into Asia, into the Pacific Rim, are they running into the same Translation problems? Well, they're much bigger on staying with the original Arabic. <laughs> I mean, they're not going to let that happen. I mean, they, the, the only real version of the Quran that's, you know, of significant, ultimate significance is, is the Arabic version, the original, yeah. And so they fight against, uh, you know, the idea of translations having any normative value. They don't have any normative value for them. Whereas our Greek translation does. It's our normative scriptures. But they can't allow that. They don't allow that. They're much stricter on that point. That's a point. Remember, it's like I said the parallel between Islam and the, Jesus is the word of God and the Quran is the word of God. That's the parallel not with our New Testament. Well, what is the language of the uh, Gnostic Gospels or the Gospel of Thomas and Philip? Yeah, I think they're, they're largely in Coptic. They were discovered in Egypt. I think they're mostly written in Coptic. The, those Gospel of Thomas and Peter and so on. Well, Do they address this brother Mm, um, I think there's uh, an assumption. I, I'd have to check. I'm thinking of I, I can't say that I can cite any text that says that. I'm not sure. No. Well, does anybody want to say what happened in their meditation? <laughs> Whatever method, yeah. Can I ask something else about meditation? Yeah. This, this strikes me so, it just amazes me, like St. Benedict, who came up with this, what is it, Lexio Divina? Yeah. Okay, now people didn't read and write the common person in those days, right? Right. Now he was just encouraging his monks. monks. Mm -hmm. But then, like the nobility, they could read and write, a lot of them. Is that correct? Then they mm -hmm. weren't, nobody meditated except the monks and then the priests and stuff? Well, no, I mean, you could, that was the method he had to use for, well, he used it because they would have a public reading. And, um, I mean, he couldn't send them all away like we did today, take your Bible and go meditate. He, he was dealing with a concrete situation. He's got monks, and he doesn't have enough books, and, he, uh, and a lot of the monks can't read them anyway. So what they do, they get like together and somebody else reads it. Somebody who knows what it is reads it, and then you're encouraged to remember it. But no, I mean, other people could use any other kind of things. There were always people who had access to manuscripts throughout the whole of Christian tradition and who read them themselves and comment on them. I'm That's just the method that he devised for his monks. Well, I mean, think, I'm thinking of, say, a generation that even before me, they all tell me they were not encouraged to read the Bible. That's right. And Catholics. So now here we're getting encouraged to read the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, that's absolutely right, um, that Catholics, uh, um, there was a great fear as a result of the Protestant Reformation of private interpretation. And so there was a movement uh, within the Catholic Church to say that, to restrict the reading of the scriptures to more public official kind of events. 
And I think it's true, you could, you could say that people, that we, it would be in our own memory that people were not encouraged to read the scriptures. And of course, the Second Vatican Council in the 60s is what changed all of that. And what part of it was the dialogue with our Protestant brothers and sisters. There were Protestant observers at the council. They had an influence on what was going on. And, a lot, and part of that influence was a renewed understanding of the scriptures. It wasn't just from the Protestant community because as soon as you recovered the liturgical traditions and the older traditions of prayer and meditation, then it became clear that scripture was important. So there were a lot of things that led into it, but what the Second Vatican Council ended up doing was talking about the importance of reading the scriptures and meditating on them. So that's what's changed. And I mean, I used to say you could walk into a house and if there was a Bible sitting on the coffee table, you'd say, I'm in a Protestant home. Well, you can't do that anymore. Or if somebody says, I'm going to Bible study tonight, you used to say, well, it must be Protestant. Now they might be coming here on Monday night to Corpus Christi. So that has really come together. And that's one of the premises of what we're doing here. Is we need to see a whole lot of, of what I'm teaching today, I never learned in the seminary. In fact, I didn't learn anything about any of it in the seminary. <laughs> <laughs> it was never mentioned. There would be no, so what did you have? A whole generation of priests who didn't know anything about for the most part about centering prayer for sure. And it depended on where you studied in terms of whether you knew Lexio Divina. And uh, depending again where you study if you knew Ignatian style. But there were, I would just say that there were a lot of priests that would have very little sense of, by their training, of the options for meditation. It would be clearest to me in the idea of mantra meditation or centering prayer. So that's, we have to, that's why we're learning. <laughs> that's why we need to learn more of the tradition. So much of the renewal, and this was Pope Benedict was so big in the renewal that he saw, he was active in the Second Vatican Council, and he saw the significance as what they call ressourcement. That is, his idea was you had to go back to the uh, fathers of the church, to the early traditions, and that that is what would uh, renew, help us renew the church. Whereas my mentor, Karl Rahner, saw, and I think Pope John XXIII, saw it not so much as ressourcement, going back to the original documents and so on, but as aggiornamento. That is how we renew the church in light of the contemporary world. And that's why Rahner and Ratzinger were together and wrote a book together and, and are on the same side of many debates in the council, but after the council, then it began to diverge between the aggiornamento people who were mostly interested, and I'd say John Paul II represented that much more than the current pope of how you engage the modern world. Whereas our current pope is much more interested in the intramural things of the, of the church and, and being faithful to those originating things, especially the teaching of the fathers, Augustine, and so on. So it's a very different take on, uh, on the council that's at work within the Catholic community. Anybody want to talk about meditation? <laughs> yeah, yes, we have one back here, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I'm still, I'm, I'm not, I keep on finding myself intellectualizing. I'm not saying I'm, in, you know, intelligent, I'm just intellectualizing yeah. things. I'm still in a trap. Like I was in Palm, Psalm 86, and it really struck me, hear me, Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and oppressed. And I got to just intellectualizing instead of going about it well. the way 
Yeah, well, I wouldn't get too upset about that. Yeah. You know, reason is one of the faculties that God gave us, <laughs> and there is a discursive side of that, yeah. as well as a more affective side. But I, I don't think that uh, is a big problem with saying. I mean, I could start to hear that in terms of uh, cries of the poor and yeah. situation of people in Latin America, or yeah. Darfur would come to my mind. I mean, I could think of a lot of things that my knowledge of the world today or my reason would take me to consider. Yeah, I don't see anything wrong oh, with okay. it. Well, I, was, I was way off on another tangent with the mm -hmm. Yeah, That's well, okay. That's okay. that was my own take. But I mean, whatever the tangent, I mean, I, it doesn't have to be a tangent. It can take you wherever you want. Oh, okay. well, you, yeah. I, don't think, I don't think we have... Uh, my mentor at Oxford, John Macquarie, wrote a book on spirituality in which he um, thought of meditation as a, as a form of thinking. You know, he had a very different take on this, that, that meditation could be uh, simply a, a way of slanting the ordinary thinking we do. So we might uh, think about Darfur and therefore ask God to bless the people there or to help the refugees there. You know, or you could think about how the blessings you've received in life and the advantages you've had and so on and, and say, thank you, Lord. So he saw prayer as a form of thinking. Now that, that ap appeals to some people. Somebody said that earlier today, that they're you know, characterizing themselves as being more rational and intellectual and so on. Go with it, you know. I don't think we should fight ourselves. We, there's a way in which uh, our, our nature guides us and our personality. That's why, oh yeah, Jerry was pointed out uh, to me, uh, the, one of the quotes from von Baldassar was about don't never get caught up in a particular method or don't get caught up in a particular technique and so on. And I, I mean, I would uh, translate that as uh, there's no one preformed way to pray. <laughs> pray uh, prayer is to lift our minds and hearts to God to be in union with Christ, and people do it different ways. If your intellect, your reason helps you move in that prayerful direction, why not? Yeah. Follow up, yeah. I just want to say, as you say it once, and uh, the parable of the, the rich fool who bought, you know, bigger barns. Yeah. yeah I just, just want to say that it was good because even though it was in, intellect, I got something entirely different out of it that I never got. Do you want to say what that is? Um, you don't have to. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's good. I mean, that's... We, yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, I gave you a chance to test it in the group here to see, but... <laughs> you passed that up, but I... It's a... It's a but, I mean, that would be an example of, of saying, well, is this weird or what I came up with? And then you'd probably get a, people thinking of it in various ways and so on. But then you can do the testing yourself. Does it sound, what you came up with, does it sound like the gospel? Does it sound like what Jesus intended? So if, if you came up with it and said, yeah, every rich person I know is going to hell because they build bigger barns, and then you say, well, that doesn't sound like Jesus, or it doesn't sound like the Christian tradition. You can test it yourself when you come up with it. Well, you can do it by yourself. <laughs> but yeah, but you, you raise an important point. We, whenever we have an insight like that, it, we have to, it, it needs to be tested in some way which would be a good segue into the next segment, maybe. Let's see if there's anything else. Yeah, Carol. I, uh, I, I don't know if it was in the year 2000 that I first learned about these, but I know it was during one of your talks. But I didn't think I went back all the way to 2000. To 2000. I have really enjoyed applying some of the ideas of the Ignatian 
Nexian type of prayer um, meditation. I have about three to five different scriptural scenes that I use depending on I guess what the mode is or what my mood is. And my latest one that I really enjoy is the trans, I think I've shared with you, the transfiguration. And I just picture you know, Jesus saying to me, you know, he doesn't want the big hoopla like Peter wants to build a tent and have all this fanciness. And the Lord is saying, you know, just to be quiet, you know, and to be silent, you know, and doesn't need all this hoopla, and so to speak. And I picture myself and him holding hand in hand um, going down the mountain, because I know I was at one talk and Dr. Gallardi had given a, an interpretation of the Transfiguration, and so he's, he was talking about how it's wonderful to be in all that gleaming glory on the mountain, but eventually you have to come down off the mountain. And that really made me to think more about this passage, and I see the Lord, we're holding hand in hand, and I really like to get into the grass and there's flowers, and it's a beautiful time of day, and we're, we're just having a wonderful time, he and I, and a lot of quiet moments where I try to listen to what he's telling me is the next step on my journey. Thank you, Carol. Great example of what Ignatius wanted to happen. It's a perfect example what Ignatius was hoping would happen. He move into the scene and something different happened. So the Lord uh, grabs Carol's hand and they walk down together. You got to take the peak experiences, live them out in the valley. That um, we guys always remember that when we walk in the dark valley to remember the truth that we knew when we were on the mountaintop. It's a wonderful notion that's in, in the tough times, not forgetting what we knew to be true at one time. I'm thinking of Margaret Files' lecture about Oscar Romero. That was his favorite passage or the one that he used over and over to, for his own meditation on the transfiguration scene. Well, that's wonderful, Carol, thank you. I am going to uh, move to the next segment, which is uh, liturgical prayer and getting us prepared for Mass at 5 o'clock, um, so that um, what we're about today is talking about how are we going to achieve greater spiritual growth, how are we going to cooperate with grace to do that, and we're looking at spiritual practices, right? And we looked at the practice of fasting, which we broadened out to say I'm fasting from whatever attachments get in my way of being a good disciple. So I'm trying to purify in purgation process. I'm doing that. Then we look next at the second step of uh, the, the whole idea of um, illumination, trying to understand better. So we saw three methods of meditation of ways that we could uh, achieve this greater illumination, understand the mystery better. Each of them are sort of either discursive, like we were hearing before, or more affective works. And now I'm at the liturgical approach. That's uh, so that baptism, Eucharist, the seven sacraments are all um, spiritual practices that can bring us closer to Christ. So I want to put it in that category because it would be easy for people to say, well, you've been talking about spiritual practices. Now we're going to talk about institutionalized religion. that has got nothing to do with spirituality. So I want to overcome that by starting out by saying, and we'll make it concrete, saying the Mass, the Eucharist is a spiritual practice. That's what it's about. It's not just a ritual that we go through or an institutional element that's part of our faith. It is a spiritual practice. That's what it's got to do with bringing us closer to Christ. And in fact, I could like link it with the contemplatio, the contemplation where we're talking about union with Christ and say, well, that's what happens in the Mass is that we have this union with Christ in a very real sense. So I could follow my purgation, illumination, contemplation schema 
that I was using to guide us and say we move to liturgy to Eucharist and we get to that close personal relationship with Christ. That's what it really is all about. So we could do this with baptism, confirmation, the other sacraments. We could do it with the sacrament of penance. I, some of my notes uh, suggest that that would be possible. But I think I'm going to uh, stay with uh, the Eucharist as being uh, the, the spiritual practice that we want to look at to see how that is going to help us grow personally and spiritually. That, that's where we're at. So as I'm doing with the other things that I want to, you know, do that theologically, see, see what the Eucharist is in a way, so that it can begin to, uh, we can see then how the practice could be improved or, or how we could get more out of it. So that's where I'm at in this whole approach here. You realize we, we could then go on to other spiritual practices like almsgiving or acts of charity, which are spiritual practices as well. Or we could do the stations or the rosary, any number of other things that are spiritual practices and always seeing how they meet our needs and how they help us to grow personally and communally. So, we talk about the Eucharist. Uh, uh, I first want to talk about the centrality of it. And, and now this becomes a very Catholic thing. Uh, to talk about because there's a way in which in the Catholic tradition the Eucharist has a centrality that it doesn't have in the Protestant traditions. Has it in the Orthodox Christian world but not so much in the Protestant world although that's gaining. So when we say in the Catholic tradition the Eucharist is central to us it is, it is what shapes our imagination. And that's a really important way to see it. It, it, it gives us our religious sensibilities and it does it in one primary way, and that is what happens at, at the Eucharist is that we say the great God is present in the person of Jesus in the simple thing of sharing bread and wine. That's the sign of the Eucharist. It's a sharing of bread and wine. We say that Christ is present in that action. And once you, 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 say, you not only say that, but we live it. I mean, uh, almost everybody can remember their first communion. We remember masses. People got married at mass. We buried loved ones at mass. We had graduation masses, home masses, retreat masses. We're going to have mass later today. And, we, and all that, what's happening to us is that's shaping our imagination, determining our religious sensibilities. And that religious sensibility is something like this. The infinite is present in the finite. The great mystery present in Jesus is present in the simplest of acts, that is sharing bread and wine. And if that's the case, then we extrapolate from that just naturally. So we Catholics end up thinking, well, the infinite is present in the beauties of nature. You know, I find God present in my spouse. You know, God is present uh, in uh, my, the work that I do. So the infinite is present in the simplest, most ordinary kind of things. That's a Catholic outlook. That's what I mean the incarnational principle. That's, that's sacramental sensibility. That's just how we are. So it makes sense for us to bless food at, on Holy Saturday or to, uh, to bless pregnant women, you know, um, to, to bless anything because it's a way, recognition of saying that, well, God is present here and now in this ordinary thing. That's one of the great gifts of my own mentor, Carl Rahner, to say that the whole world is graced. We live and move and swim in one graced world. That makes everything potentially revelatory. And it means that you can then find God in humor, in sitting down, in walking about, in going to bed, in resting, in playing golf, find it any place. <laughs> God is present. Well, he's not usually present on the golf course, but uh, <laughs> it's one exception. To, <laughs> but uh, so, it's Catholic sensibility, that's what Eucharist is about. 
And so I'm going to say a number of what I think are theological points that help us to locate the Eucharist, how it's going to help us. The second thing I want to say is that there is a rhythm to the to, to Eucharist that is the same rhythm that's going on in all of our prayer and all of our meditation. The rhythm is there's liturgy of the Word and there's liturgy of the Eucharist. What happens in the liturgy of the Word is that we listen to God addressing us as the scriptures are read. So we say Christ is present in the Word, present in the scriptures they are read. God is speaking to us through the scripture readings, hopefully through the homily that tries to apply the scripture readings. And what is our response? It's the liturgy of the Eucharist. It's to offer ourselves with Christ in thanksgiving to God for these blessings, to offer our praise and worship. So you get an address response dynamic, which is the same thing we think is happening when you're meditating on the scriptures and walking down the mountain with Jesus hand in hand, that we've been addressed and we respond. So the, the, the liturgy helps us to see that kind of a essential connection. Uh, it's God speaks and then we have the chance to respond. There's a great saying in Latin, lex orandi est lex credendi, which means the law of praying is the law of believing. So that the way we pray in the official liturgy, and that, that's what we're talking about, official liturgy, in other words, we don't just do the Eucharist however we want, there's a book that we're going to follow. And in the book, parts of it are written in red, and the Latin word for red is rubric. Ruber, ruber is the Latin for red. So when it's got red parts in there, it tells me what I'm supposed to do and what we're supposed to do. So we don't just make it up. It's not a spontaneous kind of prayer. It's a formalized, it's ritualized, it's set. It's, it's, it's there, there for us, which has a, a lot of implications. So, we then, uh, by in the, the law of following that, then it, it suggests to us about what our belief is. And that becomes the answer to Paul's point before about Jesus. How do we pray at Mass? We pray to God through Jesus. And in the most solemn part, the great amen, we, say, we pray to God through Christ in the power of the Spirit. And then we all say amen. So lex orande, the way we pray, is lex credendi. It, it is the model, the reminder of what we believe. So the one way I could have answered Paul's point about is, well, see how we pray at Mass. We pray in and through Christ. He's the mediator. Now, sometimes in our private we pray to Jesus, and every now and then, rarely, you know, we pray directly to Jesus. But the standard liturgical pattern is you pray to God through Jesus and the power of the Spirit. So the liturgy is helping us to, to understand the faith of what it is we really believe. Then the liturgy, as this set ritualized form, asks us to go into it. <laughs> in other words, we're invited to share in it, to get into it. We, we don't come and say, well, well, I don't get this part. I mean, I'm not saying this creed. I'll go along with the rest of it. When I get to the creed, I'm not. It, the invitation is to, to let it carry us. In other words, it, it's not like f private prayer where you can do anything you want with the transfiguration scene. It's, no, you come here, celebrate the Eucharist, then we get into those prayers. We, we try to adapt. It, it, it reminds us that the community of faith isn't a voluntary organization for us Catholics. You know, well, we think we'll go form a new church over here, and so we got a preacher who we like, and we can emphasize what we want. There's a facticity about it. It's a tradition. It's there, and you're born into it, and you go along. It doesn't mean you can't question it, but when you gather for liturgy, it doesn't seem like the good time to say, well, is Jesus consubstantial with the Father or not? I mean, 
you do that in a classroom or some other place. When you get here, you say the creed. You, you, we adapt ourselves to it. So, let me try another thing. What, litur what litur Eucharistic liturgy is good at is that it uh, forces us to check our own natural rhythms. Now, I'm getting back to a point that I've made a number of times. When we're doing the private kind of prayer, we have our own rhythms. And you're in a joyful mood, so you read uh, the Gospel of Luke 15 and hear about forgiveness, and it's great. But the liturgy forces us to, to check out our rhythms. So first thing it does is the great the Eucharist, the most important feast. Someone asked me this the other day. Well, I don't know, was I on TV or something? I don't remember the setting. But, but anyway, the question was, um, well, what's the most important feast for, for Christians? Oh, it was a Christian, Muslim, Jewish dialogue. Yeah. Um, and, and my answer was, I didn't say Easter. I didn't say Christmas. What did I say? Sunday. I said Sunday. Sunday's the building block of the liturgical year. In fact, before you had any of the rest of it, Christmas came much later, and making the, the resurrection celebration special. You had East, uh, you had Christ, Sunday. That's what you did. That, well, who are Christians? They gather on the Lord's Day, the Lord, day of his resurrection, and they celebrate together. So Sunday is the key thing. And what does that tell you? There's a rhythm to life. There's a time for Sabbath. There's a time to rest, to, to set aside time for the Lord. So the, the liturgy becomes a challenge to our busy world. Well, people might ask, you know, I mean, is Sunday the day you're supposed to have all the sporting events? I mean, kids playing sports at 11 o'clock Sunday morning? I mean, what happens with that? You know, or is that the day, well, whatever. Everyone understands the problem. So the, 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 the liturgy, Eucharist, it challenges our rhythms. That's the first way it challenges our rhythms, is to say you got to set aside time, even if you're busy, for to reflection, for prayer, worship, be quiet, have real leisure, and so on. Another way it does it is by the seasons. So let's take Lent. For example, so I might be going along and uh, not being doing much penance at all and getting caught up in worldly pursuits and eating too much or drinking too much or uh, whatever. And then Lent comes along. It says, whoa, wait a second. You know, you might not be ready right now to do penance, but that's what the church is calling us to do. So there's Ash Wednesday to get started. So what it does is force us to, to move through this and to, to bring penance in, even if we're not really ready for to do it right now. Do it anyway. It's Ash Wednesday. Get a penance. Get with it. As the whole community's doing it. Well, get with the program. Or let's say we're in the Easter season. You know, we might be in a foul mood or life isn't good or whatever. And Easter comes along, Easter season, long season. We say, no, where's the joy of the resurrection? No, where's the joy in my life? How am I going to communicate the value of the gospel? There's no joy in my life. No, people can't see that, that the Easter's part of who I am. So you can go on. I, I, another great example is Advent. So December is the busiest month of the year for many people, and you know, the most hectic and frenzied and craziness that goes on in our culture. And we come to church, and there's an Advent. It says, let's take longer silence periods at the liturgy. Let's be quiet longer. Let's reflect more. It challenges December. December busyness. So you can keep going with that. And you see uh, what happens with the liturgy is you keep getting the, this, this sort of challenge to, to the rhythm, ordinary rhythms of life. Well, that's... Um, <laughs> I might as well finish this <laughs> while I'm at it. So <laughs> that, that's my theological perspective. Then it's a question of... Uh, now, what do we do about that to get 
more into it. Um, how are we going to do this in a relatively brief period of time? Um, well, there's things that people do to get more out of the liturgy. One thing that many people do is discuss the readings ahead of time. There's many people in renew groups or smaller groups, and they get together and they read over the Sunday readings and they talk about them. Might come up with things that have no connection with what goes on in the homily or anything else, and yet it's enriching. And maybe there's insight shared. So that seems to be one good way to get ready for the, the Eucharistic celebration to get more out of it so it is a genuine spiritual exercise. Some people will find that if um, they join more clearly their, what do I say, their private prayer with that. So part of private prayer would be to get ready for the liturgy, to make sure there's that same structure of listening to God and then responding. So if we get that rhythm as part of our own private prayer, then when we come here and we get listening and responding, we're better prepared to participate in it. Uh, for some people, um, I think it is a matter of finding key points throughout the liturgy that will tune us into the spiritual value. So one would be when we come in and pass the font, dip our hands in the wa baptismal water, make the sign of the cross, which is a reminder of our baptism and that through that we participate in the death and resurrection of Christ. That's what's going on in this liturgy. By baptism, I've been initiated into this community. I'm part of it. Now I need to, to, to worship together with the others. So that, that's like a touchstone to remind me why I came here. And then we can use the uh, forgiveness of sins at the beginning. You know, you think, boy, I screwed up a lot during the week and it's been a tough time, and, um, but we've got a prayer of forgiveness. You always got to remember that. Eucharist, it's not just sacrament of penance that forgives sins, but the Eucharistic, we have a prayer of penance and then the priest says the prayer that God forgives us. So there's a penitential rite and a forgiveness element that comes into the Mass right at the beginning so we don't have to be there with guilt feelings and can move on through the liturgy. I think I always suggest that um, people have touchstones throughout the Mass that when we've lost our attention and we forgot why we're here and we're minds a hundred places else, have a touchstone for yourself. So one of them I always think is to stand for the Gospel. So we've been seated for the first two readings and maybe you took a nap or if I asked you what was the first reading about, you wouldn't have the foggiest notion and so on. But to stand for the God, ooh, I got to get this one. So I say one out of three is good. I mean, you know, it's better than zero for three. Um, pay people a lot of money to hit 333. Uh, millions of dollars. So. You know, we can't be too hard, but I'm standing up. Oh, yeah, I should better listen to this one. Get this one. Um, or coming to communion. Seems to me that that would be a, a touchstone point. Uh, um, it takes a little time, work your way up here, and I'm out walking, I'm on a journey. I need nourishment for the journey of life. Uh, this is my moment of communion. I'm going to be with Christ. This whole goal of my prayer life is to have uh, contemplation, to have union, to rest in Christ. This is my chance. I got to be open to this. I want to be reverent and uh, try to make the most out of communion. I mean, you could do it with any part of the Mass, but the point is to have planned triggers. It doesn't make any sense to get through the whole hour and five minutes and say, I wasn't here. I mean, you know, what, why bother, in a sense, uh, if it wasn't a spiritual exercise? So it, the trigger points are ways of avoiding that. You know, it's not good to make the trigger point the last blessing. <laughs> <You know. laughs> I mean, this is not a wise strategy. Then, I think it, it's, um, it's uh, good to... Uh, maybe have some sort of, a, well, you could do something with the Lord's Prayer. You know, Thomas Aquinas said the Lord's Prayer is the perfect prayer. 
And Augustine thought the Lord's Prayer summed up all the scriptural teaching on prayer. So what we could do is have a meditation on the Lord's Prayer that's part of our outlook before we come or that we do sometimes. You can read it, it's better to read it in Matthew's Gospel, that's the one we use at Mass. Um, so read it there. But there's all kind of good stuff in the, that perfect prayer. You know, first we address God as Abba. That's the invitation, you know. There are, incidentally, as we talk, there are Aramaic words in the New Testament, in the Greek New Testament. There are Aramaic words. Abba is one of the ones. Maranatha is another one that's in the book of Revelation. So Aramaic phrases do end up in the Greek translation. I didn't make that point before, but it's true. So we got, um, we pray Abba. So that right away, that's the familiarity with God, closeness to God that Jesus had, inviting us to have that. And then we're, we're thinking about uh, God's uh, will be, uh, the God, we want to hallow God's name. So in the prayer, we're praising God um, for God's, uh, talking about God's glory. And then we're thinking about the petitions we can ask for forgiveness of sins as we forgive others. We pray for our daily bread have sustenance for ourselves. We pray for strength in the temptations of life that are going to come. We pray, when we think of that, we think of the temptation of Jesus, his own struggle with the demonic forces, and that we, our own struggles, he's there as support and strength for us. So, in other words, you could go through the whole thing. And I, I didn't stress enough the forgiveness because it's so crucial to the teaching of Jesus. Forgive us as we forgive others. What a challenge that is to go out of the liturgy and to put it into practice in one way or another. So another, and what I'm saying is another way to get more out of the Mass is to spend some quiet time thinking about the Lord's Prayer, which Augustine says contains the whole of the Gospel. And Aquinas says the perfect prayer. So it's worthy of reflection ahead of time. Then we get and stand up, say the Lord's Prayer, then maybe it means more to us. And then maybe finally I would say that the great importance of having some resolution that comes out of it so that this spiritual exercise leads us into some acts of charity, to tending to the poor, to reconciling with an enemy, to doing our job well, to whatever it is that we're called upon to do so that we make the connection explicitly. Maybe it'd be a nice thing to do before we left is all of us had some idea of putting it into practice. I always, um, I, I sort of like it when people say about the homily, well, that gave me something I'm gonna do this week. <laughs> I like that. I like to hear that because then the, the connection has been made. That's a lot of what the homily is supposed to do, is help people make the connections with daily life so we can live out the gospel. And, and, and people do that because I hear it from people, which I think is great. Well, that's um, thoughts on uh, the, the, the liturgy, the Eucharist specifically, as uh, a spiritual practice. It's not a ritual that we just go through or something, a routine or an obligation. It's a spiritual practice. And we, every time we come here, we ought to be spiritually renewed or enriched. That's, that's what it is. If not, we've missed what it's all about. And again, we Catholics are in such danger of this. Of for, great Catholic temptation is formalism. That is, you did it. You know, I went to Mass, I fulfilled my duty, and great. Um, and, and we really have to struggle to get beyond that very often, that it, it's not what it's about. Well, I'd like to suggest we do another half hour and, and gather for Mass at five, and um, maybe we'll figure out a way to get more out of it this time. Is that, I, I, maybe I should allow, one quick question from Bevers. One of the wonderful things about the Mass here is the music yeah. as, a, as a spiritual aspect of it, and you didn't touch on that. Yeah. 
Very good. The music, uh, very important. And, and we are fortunate to have Mr. Luke Rosen leading the music for this next Mass at 5 o'clock. I have prevailed upon the music minister to lead the music. And he's going to help us sing the Gloria together and the responses. And we hear that from so many people that the music is important to our young people. It's a lot of people. But, you know, and I did answer that in relationship to Pat before. of we're talking about the music with playing in here when you do the stations or the labyrinth. But you're right to connect that in with the liturgy. So a lot of the liturgy and the point I didn't really make, uh, and I'm glad for the comment, is... Uh, that um, we are called to full, active, conscious participation. That's what the Vatican Council, Second Vatican Council. So that's what we're always after, full, active. And part of that is singing, singing, saying the prayers, singing and, and, and joining into the community. So it's a, it's a public celebration. It's a communal celebration. It's not a time for saying the rosary. A rosary would be a private devotion for most part. It's a time to get into the flow of what the liturgy is all about. And music's a big part of that. I'm glad you brought it up. And, and what Augustine had a saying for everything. He who sings well prays twice. He has a saying for everything. <laughs> it doesn't matter what the topic is. There's a, there's a quote from Augustine that fits. Yeah, yeah, we're going to, yeah. Um, the period after the liturgy in this church, in the gathering space, mm. I think is so very important. Yeah. That we touch bases with each other's lives. It's like what happens here is carried out into the gathering space right. of our lives. And that's uh, Father Richard Vosco, the liturgical consultant for this parish, made a big thing out of you got to have a gathering space for both before Mass and after. And, and that's uh, so crucial. It's part of uh, how we begin to take the message out into the world. It's a stepping stone and a stopping place on that process of taking the message out. So part of it is sharing it there. And, it, and it's right, the, the architecture, I mean, the architecture here, <laughs> I mean, we're really blessed. <laughs> face, I tell the visiting priests, if you ever celebrate Mass here, preside at Mass, you're not gonna wanna do it anyplace else. I mean, when I go to other places, it just doesn't seem right. I mean, it's incredible the way this speaks. You know, the whole thing of Christ-centered, the, the altar's in the absolute center. The whole faith is Christocentric. Faith is a matter of a personal relationship with Christ. What's all this prayer about? To be in union with Christ. He's the center. And then the idea of this, the community. It's a community celebration. And so we're able to see one another and be gathered around. And then the communion of saints, that's what Aquinas said, that the, the Eucharist is a foretaste of heaven. He has beautiful prayers. Aquinas was great on the Eucharist and Pange Lingua and you know, Sacra Convivium, the, the great prayers that he wrote all show the, the greatness of the Eucharist, but this being surrounded by the communion of saints, it's like we're here, we're the saints on the earth, but we're united with those saints and our own personal saints who are up there, that we put up there ourselves, and uh, united with them in this whole process of worshiping God. So, and then the font, having to walk by the font, the baptismal font, and dipping a hand, everything about it is, is, and then it reminds, the devotions on the outer edge of it, like Mary over there and Joseph over there, they're, they're part of what flows from the liturgy, the devotion to the saints, and um, the icon, back out of the, we had to breathe out of two lungs, as our Pope said, breathe out of the Eastern Church lung with the icon. That's Russian iconography, Russian tradition. So the architecture here, including the gathering space, speaks to all of this, I think. Yeah. But what about uh, the relegation of the Blessed Sacrament in another space which some Catholics don't seem to mm. understand? Yeah. Well, I think that's a, a, a good thing. Uh, in fact, I mean, in the major churches in Rome, you would have a separate ba sac uh, Blessed Sacrament chapel. It's very traditional. Um, 
and so it, it makes it special that they have that chapel. And, uh, and it also brings up that adoration is of the Blessed Sacrament is, um, flows from the liturgy. As the Council of Trent said, adoration of the Blessed Sacrament is all right, is an okay practice, even though Jesus instituted the Eucharist for our feeding. <laughs> I mean, in other words, they got, had it clear what it's all, the Eucharist is all about the nourishment, the sharing in the bread and wine. It's not about looking, it's about eating, you know, so that it, it's very important to see that Eucharistic adoration flows from what the essential meaning of the Eucharist is, eating, sharing the meal, participating in Christ that way, the, the foretaste of the banquet of heaven. But out of that, as the church has insisted, that adoration is a good thing. So it's very good in my mind that the chapel, Blessed Sacrament Chapel is separate. That, that's where you go next. That's what uh, the thing you do after liturgy. You know, it, 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 there's a connection, uh, but the primary action is here in the sharing of the bread and wine. You know, in the 14th century, it got so bad in the Catholic Church that people didn't go to communion, they went to look. That's why they rang the bell, so you knew that to, time to look. It was actually a practice of Catholics to go from one church to the other so they could be there for the elevation and see Christ, and then go to another church a little later and see him elevated again. I mean, that's how far in the Catholic world we got away from what the Eucharist is all about, the, um, the, the eating, eating of the bread and wine. Uh, so we, the, the architecture of this church, I think, reinforces that most proper thing about what the Eucharist is all about. It's first the meal shared, it's first the sacrifice of Christ, and then there's time for adoration as another spiritual practice. So you bring out, that's a spiritual practice. And, and it's a growing one, it's interesting, it's growing. And our, many of our young people are very interested in doing it. And so our job is to provide that for our young people and to make sure they see and know that it's linked to the Eucharistic celebration. The Eucharist is given not for looking, but for eating. Uh, let's let Mike have a question, and then we'll have a very short time before Mass. This is last one. I'll make it less long as I was going to. Now, uh, related to that last question, I'm very interested in the relationship between individual spiritualities that we've been talking about this <coughs> afternoon. Not all afternoon. We were talking about liturgical spirituality and in this, this last segment. About the relationship between our individual spiritualities and the communal spirituality of, of, of liturgy. And in particular, so much emphasis previously on the sort of pragmatic nature. What works for you? And what, you know, do you find in spiritual mm -hmm. teaching? How that relates to... Obviously, that's quite challenged. The pragmatic view is challenged by a liturgical spirituality, which is, as you mentioned, focus on ritualization. You, you don't necessarily... Well, this works for me. Is, you know, yeah. I'm do it this way, which is different. And, and so that interplay, that challenge, but also the confusion as you were just addressing with how adoration can get, you know, seep into liturgical spiritualities or how you can have a mass for social justice even and, and how that might be a distortion of what liturgy is. Mm -hmm. you know, when, when that gets confused, individual spiritualities and the communal liturgy. Well, I mean, that's a good point, and the two interact, and I, I think that whenever we were talking earlier about whatever more, what is the word I want to use, private prayer kind of thing, I always wanted to put it into a communal context. I mean, it's like my response to whatever came out of the building, this night your soul is required of you. A guy built a big barns. You know, th there has to be a communal judgment about what you got out of that particular story. So that we, there's always the judgment of the community and the liturgy functions that way. I'm gonna say, call it, let's, we're gonna assemble here again at five for liturgy. <laughs>